Good morning. We are in the beautiful state of Kansas. It's actually a perfect day, perfect morning. This is a 345 to 345 substation for a wind farm. I know we've been doing a lot of 345 KB primary yards. Um, it's really just been a coincidence. Um, We've done these yards for 138 systems, 230 kV, 500 kV, 69 kV. It's just been a coincidence that all of our subs this year have been uh, 345. So one thing that I wanted to show in this video that's kind of unique to this substation is the different types of interlock systems. So there's physical interlocks, there's keyed interlocks, relay, um, hardwire interlocks, and this substation has it all. So I figured I'd show you about those today. So one type of interlock system that you can't see here, but it's, it's installed is a hardwire interlock system. So these switches here uh, open and close, but they are not load brake switches. If you open up this switch under a load, depending, I guess, on the, on the severity of the load, you would most likely burn up the contacts. Um, so th that's, uh, that is not supposed to happen. So uh, in this breaker, there's a lot of normally open, normally closed contacts in here. And one of those contacts runs to the motor operator of this switch. So if the condition is this breaker is closed, well, pr it probably grabs a normally, uh, normally closed contact. So this one will be open and they'll use that and wire that through the motor circuit. So if this breaker is closed, it will physically not allow power to go to this switch and open up. But once you open up the breaker, it'll close that contact and it will allow power to flow to the motor operator to open it. So that's, that's one way, really a foolproof way to ensure that this switch is never accidentally opened up under a load. So that's one type of uh, interlock system. Another type of system is uh, kind of a, a relaying uh, interlock system. Um, part of it's it can be done logically uh, through the software, also uh, physically. So for example, um, we have some lockout relays here. If there is an issue with either of these um, relays, which it could be anything, over current, over voltage, um, maybe under voltage, uh, current differential, tons of different types of issues, this relay will trip the interlock and the lock, excuse me, the, the lockout relay, and that will not allow you to close in, close back in that breaker or that switch or whatever that device may be. So it, it basically forces you to see that there's a problem, look into the relay, find out what the potential issue is before you just go blindly close it back in. So that's another type of uh, interlock system. So while I'm walking out here, I noticed something kind of unique. Um, we have this disconnect and uh, manual transfer switch outside. So this building normally, uh, well, it, it was wired up to have two sources of power, one coming from the station service transformer, which you see right there. And the second is from the incoming utility, uh, from a pole. The owner uh, last minute wanted to add a generator, which would be a third source of power. Well, there's literally no room on the walls anymore in the, in the control house it's it's really designed to be as small as possible with the equipment you need so the only other option was to put this manual transfer switch outside and we had to penetrate into this brand new building which broke my heart to do and basically tap in to the system with a manual transfer switch so i think we jumped in between the utility and the the automatic transfer switch and wired this into it so the automatic transfer switch is great for two sets of power but if you want that third set this is a manual so you'd have to physically come out here and close that in so basically they've got two sources of power with automatic transfer and a third source on a manual transfer kind of interesting but uh i guess you got to do what you got to do another fairly unique thing it's not all uncommon i guess but it's um on, on these transformers they have uh basically a real-time gas uh, DJ monitor. So this will constantly check the oil. It will check for moisture in the oil. It'll check for gases. It'll check for you know other components, carbon, things like that. So you really get a 
real time uh, health assessment of your transformer. Uh, otherwise, you would have to probably send somebody out here once every six months or once a year, whatever schedule that is, to physically take a sample, um, box it up, and ship it somewhere to, to be tested. So it's kind of an expensive unit, but it's great to have. Sorry about the wind, guys. It really started picking up here. Uh, so the third type of interlock system is called a Kirk Key interlock system. Kirk, K-A-R-K. -K, it's actually a brand. They're really the kind of the leaders in uh, keyed interlock systems. So we'll talk about one of them here um, on this capacitor bank. I've already got the panel open. So say you want to work on this capacitor bank. You need to ground the thing out. Um, there's a grounding switch attached to these capacitor banks. You can see the blade's down right now. So I want to go ground it. Well, I can't. Why? Well, there's this little keyed lock here, and there's a piston right there. So why why can't I close that? Well, because of the Kirk key interlock system. So in order to get the key, it's actually at the controller. The controller has to be open, and then it will give you the key. It's the only way to get the key out. If this was closed, you could not get the key. So now that it's open, and it allows me to get that key, I can come in and that piston moves away, and now I can ground the system. Now my capacitor bank's grounded, and I can safely work on it. There's no stored energy. Um, totally safe to work on. So, say it's getting towards the end of the day, getting hot and tired, I go home. So I finish what I'm doing, I come over here, put my switch in local, and I go to close it. Well, why isn't it closing? Oh, it needs that key. Well, in order to get that key, I can't pull it out now. It has to have that piston out. So, unground the switch. Get that key out. Piston came in. Now I have the key. And I cannot, cannot ground it. That's exactly how you want it. So since I have that key in my hand, sorry about the wind. Can put that key in. Local. Now it closes. So that Kirk key interlock system prevents you from potentially closing in the capacitor bank or whatever device it is uh, grounded. So that's how that system works. Um, also, uh, I'm not sure if this one has it, but there's features where there's an internal timer inside. So if I open up the capacitor bank, it will put a timer on this to where I can't pull it out for five minutes. Why is that? Well, what they want you to do is have the, the capacitors bleed out the power by themselves. They do not want you to close those, or excuse me, open up that, the energized capacitors and then close this grounding switch. You might burn up the switch after a couple times doing that. Um, you don't want to have that type of instant uh, current coming through these capacitor banks. In fact, you may pop one of the small fuses there. These aren't meant for instantaneous drain. Uh, it's just to really take care of uh, low, brief low spots um, in your, your grid. So that's the third type of system. Uh, it's a keyed interlock system. All right, those guys are rocking out with their music down there. Hopefully it doesn't distract you too much. So uh, the last system here at the substation is, is honestly, it's unique. It's probably the first time I've uh, installed a system like this. It's, it's a physical interlocking system. So just as we showed that um, the capacitor bank had grounding switches, these also have grounding switches on them. Uh, they are, sorry about the sun there. They're right there, A, B, and C. Um, so this, it's the same deal. You never want to be able to close uh, the ground into a potentially energized system. So how this is designed is if the switch is closed, you can physically not ground the system. So right now, that switch is closed. Here's my grounding handle to pull the grounding switches up. What's happening is this, this post twists, but it cannot twist because this pipe is preventing it from twisting. So it's physically preventing me from closing that ground switch. Okay, so oops, uh, I tried to close in on a energized system. So let's, let's open the switch. So 
So if you notice now, that pipe has physically moved through the, through the bolts and the linkage. Now I got to close my grounding switch. Check it out. It's grounded. Okay, so say somebody else shows up and they want to energize this circuit. I'm not really paying attention. They go to close, close the switch now. Same thing. You cannot physically close that switch if it's grounded. So it protects you kind of on uh, both ways, which is uh, a pretty, pretty simple yet uh, ingenious way to physically lock out uh, your switches from being closed in the ground. Um, great idea. Again, it's not something you see very often. It seems uh, primitive, but it, it works great. So, and that's there the the fourth different type of interlock system that we have out here at this yard. So um, it's fairly unique to have, have uh, four different types out here at one substation. So I thought you guys kind of get a kick out of that. Um, can maybe talk a little bit here about the capacitor bank, then I gotta go. Um, so we have three capacitor banks out here. I don't remember what the MVARs is for them. We also have the reactor banks. So the reactor banks help with, um, if you got light loads, on your system. In some cases, with, with long transmission lines and long uh, underground cables, you can get, um, it acts like a capacitor, and you'll actually have a higher voltage on the end than you will uh, where your voltage is coming from. So you would think that that doesn't compute, right? You should never have more. But with a capacitive effect, that'll, that'll actually happen. Same with transmission lines. So these uh, reactors here, shunt reactors, will help bring that uh, capacitance down and level out your system voltage. And uh, in this case, they're really the, the value of that is based on a lot of factors. It's based on what the utility uh, wants to see as far as power factor. It's based on the type of power factor that these uh, turbines produce. And actually, if I zoom out there, you can see one being put in way out there. They just got the cell on. They're probably grabbing the first blade right now. So opposite to the shunt reactors are the capacitor banks. These help uh, when the system is loaded up and the voltage is dropping. These help raise the voltage uh, and, and, again, regulate things. But uh, the slightly opposite effect of the reactors. So there's three banks here. Don't recall the MVARs and one set of reactors. And then on the other side of the project, same thing. Three more reactor banks plus the reactor bank. So again, it's based on the utility requirements and uh, what type of power the, the turbines produce. Now there are certain cases where you can purchase a power factor correction system from the turbine manufacturers and it's a pretty expensive system. I think it actually doesn't pan out money-wise, but it eliminates you uh, from having the capacitor banks here at the substation. They actually have them built into the, the turbines themselves. So another kind of neat, neat factor. So uh, some state of substations you'll see these, that's why. Uh, some state of substations you won't see capacitor banks and reactor banks. Some substations you'll see just capacitor banks or just reactor banks. There's a lot of variables that go into figuring out exactly what each substation needs. So walking through here, you noticed a little bit of wobble here. These are called expansion joints. They're there on purpose. Uh, it keeps the connection from being a solid connection and lets that aluminum uh, expand and contract as the temperature changes, and that could be due to the current running through it and or the ambient temperature. It shouldn't quite be bouncing like that. I'm just going to have the guys make sure that they put damper wire inside. So uh, believe it or not, inside most of the hard bus that you see here, there's uh, damper wire inside, and the damper wire is basically the, the stranded cable. It's called AAC, all aluminum conductor, and it keeps the vibration down. Uh, so that's not something you might not have known, but all the bus that you see in, in every substation, usually over six feet or 10 feet or more, has a piece of damper wire inside of it. So it's heading out of the substation, walking underneath the dead end. Trying to stay away from the wind here. This is what we call the dead end, and it is super loud. I'm hoping you can hear it instead of hearing the wind. So it seems a little louder than normal. So kind of looking into things a little bit here. Um, you, 
this is called Corona that you're hearing. Um, it typically jumps off of sharp edges. So there are things that we have in place to keep the noise down, like that ring, called a Corona shield. Those cut down on the noise. There's also hardware shields that go over the hardware to prevent uh, like the tips of the bolts from having Corona. Uh, but we noticed, or I noticed here, that the top connections, they don't have those Corona shields. And that's probably why it's as loud as it is. So uh, it actually wasn't shown in the drawings. So we're gonna go send an RFI to the engineer and say, hey, um, we think we need these. It's a little loud. It doesn't necessarily cause damage, but it will corrode things over time and bolts. And um, it's not a great thing for the long term. So we'll hopefully get that corrected and this uh, dead end will be a lot quieter. I'll get in the middle, maybe we can get some stereo effect. I don't know how it does on the funnel and with the wind. Sorry, guys. Yeah, that dead end is super loud. Well, anyway, guys, uh, that's about it. Uh, I'm glad I was able to show you some kind of unique things about the substation with the interlock systems. And I'll try to do a video again in the next few weeks. Thanks.